Welcome to the History Nerd United Podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today we have author Eric Blem and his book, The Darkest White. This is about snowboarder Craig Kelly. I love this conversation because Eric is a snowboarder. He's not writing about something he doesn't know. He loves snowboarding. So enthusiastic about talking about Craig Kelly and his legacy. I mean, his excitement is infectious. I can't wait for you to hear this podcast, so let me shut up so you can hear it. Let's do it. And here we are with author Eric Blem, the darkest white, a mountain legend, and the avalanche that took him. Eric, thank you so much for coming on. I'm honored. Listen, it, it's a great book. And I mean, I have to say, I was just looking at your Twitter, and it's been almost 20 years since the last season ended up on the New York Times bestseller list, right? Yeah, it's been a while. It was, it was chosen as the best nonfiction book of 2006 by a new author. It was like the first claim to fame with the last season. And that kind of got me started, got me rolling in this, I always say, fighting the good fight with words. I will say, does this feel almost kind of like revisiting the last season? Because you you also have a lot of critically acclaimed books that are on, you know, military subjects, military folks. But this one, it's almost you're going back to the great outdoors and looking at a tragedy. Does this feel like you're kind of, you know, revisiting one of your best hits almost? Yeah, I mean, it's it's also a full circle for, you know, really what brought me to this whole writing life. I mean, snowboarding, I was the editor of a tra of Transworld Snowboarding magazine in the early 90s to late 90s. And I stepped away from that to go freelance. And that is really, you know, the full circle. And when what well, we'll get into it, when the subject of this book was killed in this avalanche, that was kind of when I stepped away from writing about snowboarding. And um, for 20 years, I feel like these other books were just kind of me in training to come back and write my opus, if you want to consider it. If I, I consider that, I mean, I put my heart and soul into this book, I would say more than any other, because I was close to the subject matter. Definitely full circle. And I got to say, just to make it very clear, right? Lady history nerd, she's a snowboarder. She knew everything she was reading it. I have not. I'm the guy that stays in the lodge by the fireplace with the hot chocolate. And like, we both loved it. I mean, this is just something I've never heard about before. And it's not something that necessarily like, I'm like, oh, you know, especially with your reputation. And this book came to me and I just started up and I'm like, oh man, like this is something. Cause it's not even Craig Kelly. Like you're telling the story of snowboarding simultaneously, right? Right. No, absolutely. It's a book for anybody. And that's why I wrote it that way. If I had a book that came out and said, I want to tell the story of the, the guy who was the Michael Jordan of snowboarding back in the 80s and 90s, and his name's Craig Kelly, how many people would pick up that book? I wanted to share this this legend, this person who was a hero and an icon, a, you know, a compass who pointed the way for everything that you see in snowboarding now. And that was really my goal in this. I wanted to make it accessible to the general readership. Because people who love the first generation of snowboarders who were guided by Craig Kelly and looked up to him and, you know, lionized him, he was an icon. And they're going to pick up a book about him no matter what. I wanted to introduce this guy to everybody else in the world. It's my goal in 2024. I don't want to ever meet somebody who I say, have you ever heard of Craig Kelly? And they say, no, I haven't heard of Craig Kelly. This is the year to bring Craig Kelly's spirit back to the planet. It hasn't left for a whole generation, but I want to bring it to that wider audience. Do you remember the first time you heard Craig's name? Oh, for sure. Yeah. International Snowboard Magazine, or the cool kids would call it ISM. That was my Bible. Uh, my mom died when I was 17 after like a four-year battle with cancer. And I spent a lot of time in the hospital, you know, it, it, visiting her you know, at a young age. And, you know, I just picked up snowboarding at that top point. She died in 1986. I'd been snowboarding for a couple of years and I always had an ISM with me. And it was like my escape and it became my goal in life to be Craig Kelly. You know, he was this guy who was accessible to all of us. He was, there were a lot of snowboarders who were known for their wild, whatever, their wild hair, their, you know, they were bad boys. They were the guys flipping off the camera, the skaters, the punks. And Craig could hang with all those guys, but he could also hang with the European hard boot racers who were just like, you cob, you cob, you cob, you know, you're, they're very, you know, straight edge, straight and narrow athletes. And Craig kind of merged the gap to all of from between all those people. He brought discipline to the sport and he just looked like an ordinary guy. A lot of people will come back and say, oh, he was a prodigy. Craig was a, this prodigy who excelled and just, he took the sport by storm. He was a four-time world champion. But when you dig into his story, he, 
he wasn't, he wasn't like a natural prodigy. He had to work his ass off to get as good as he was. And, um, that was what was so cool. When you'd read his interviews, he would talk about that. And for me as a kid learning, trying to become a pro myself in the eighties, I could read that. I'm like, yeah, I kind of suck at this right now, um, at some aspect of the sport, but I'm good at this part. And if I really work hard, that was the kind of guy that Craig was, you know, he was speaking out to kids like me that could, would say, you work hard and you will achieve, you know, what your, you know, your goals and everything. It's also super important that he was like this just so that snowboarding can get respect outside of the sport, right? Because, I mean, when you talk about the beginning of snowboarding, there was nowhere to do it. Like, yeah, you know, I'm sure everybody thinks about it nowadays. It's like, oh, they're skiers, they're snowboarders, nobody cares. But when this first started, even finding a place to go was almost impossible, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, Time Magazine called it the worst new sport of 1988. There was only like 36 ski areas that allowed it. And it took years to get to that point. I mean, I would go hiking off the side of the road for the first two years of snowboarding for me, you know, in the early 80s or mid 80s, kind of like the skaters of the snow where you were outlawed from the streets. You had to find someplace to go. And the skiers were the promised land. They were the utopia. They had lifts. You know, you could either hike all day and get one run or two runs or three runs, or you could get that much snowboarding done with one chairlift ride. So imagine once these guys, once we finally got on a chairlift, that's when the skill levels just compounded and, uh, and we were allowed. It was kind of like, again, it was like, oh my gosh, utopia. We can actually ride up a chairlift and snowboard down the mountain. How crazy is that? Because they really did... I mean, I would go to a lift ticket window, see if they would allow me to go somewhere. And they'd say, go away, little boy. There's a sledding area down the street. I mean, they were considered sleds, toys. And in the beginning, they kind of were. So to be honest, they weren't necessarily. But once they got steel edges and we got high back bindings and you could strap in and you could turn and you could carve, you know, everybody's question was, can you turn that thing? Can you stop? Transversal Snowboarding Magazine actually came out with a sweatshirt that was called The Answers. And the first one was, Yes, I can turn and even stop. Now, especially with Craig, as you said, he was not a prodigy. Like, he worked his butt off. That's how he got so good. I know I thought this, too. I'll just say it, right? Oh, well, he was kind of world class because, you know, there wasn't a ton of snowboarders. There wasn't a ton of events and things like that. If somebody who was ignorant like myself, I'll admit it, said, like, well, would Craig even be that good nowadays now that there is way more competition or was he that good back then, even though snowboarding was not nearly as big as it is now? Well, you know what? I will say there's people, you can look at photos of Terry Kidwell, the father of freestyle, for instance, you know, boosting a big, huge backside air method air or whatever. I mean, he was doing McTwists in the late seventies. Uh, so there was that skill level and they were getting big air at the time. So there were people that were doing not as big as today, but the half pipes and everything that you see in the X games didn't exist either. The half pipes that we rode were like ditches. So I would say that what ultimately separated Craig from everybody else was his style. And some people might say that's innate, but he had this smooth flowing ethereal style that was just beautiful to watch. And to this day, very few people can emulate that, especially riding in powder. He was very smooth. His first movie was that he, you know, had named after him was called The Smooth Groove. And that smoothness, very few people have been able to emulate Craig Kelly even today. So style is one thing. Tricks and amplitude and speed is another. But again, style is really hard. You can't hide that on video. And he was one of the few people who could do that at that time. What I find also just kind of funny, too, is, and you say it right in the book, is that Craig's coming up and he's learning, he's working, and it's just funny because the old guard are like 30-year-olds, right? Because snowboarding is so new, so it's like you'd be an 18, 19, 20-year-old, and you're talking to like the old guy, right, that's out there on the board, and it's like, he's 32. Yeah. This was so new, and they were all, I mean, Craig was more than a snowboarder. He was basically an inventor, too. Like, he was figuring out along with everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it, I mean, the oldest guys in the sport when Craig picked it up, I think we're like 32 and they were, you know, 
the soul surfers. I mean, Tom Sims, um, Jake Burton Carpenter, Dmitry Malovich with Winter Stick. These guys were older, but they were still just in their 30s. And Craig was, you know, a young gun. What's really weird is you look back, I look back, and I always thought of Craig as being, you know, he's two years older than me. And I always thought that he was, you know, like a decade older, like 10 years older than me, just because he seemed larger than life. And it's funny, a, a couple of the guys I would ask some of the writers, how do you remember how tall Craig was? Every single person said, oh, he was like six, six foot, six one. He was like, you know, five, ten. He's grown over time just with his legend, honestly. I think that everybody always assumes he was a little bit older, a little bit taller, whatever, because he was just this guy who was larger than life. How long did it take him before people were like, he's the man, that's the guy? About how old was he when people would say, that's the king right there? Well, he, he was such a, he was very smart. He graduated high school when he was 17, his first semester in University of Washington in a chemical engineering program. He was 17 years old. So very smart, very cerebral. And he, his first contest would have been in um, 85. So he was 19 at his first contest. And it was the uh, Mount Baker Bank Slalom. Uh, at that time, they called it the Sims Open. And even then, there was that style. Like I said, he was fast. But Tom Sims, who was a you know world champion skateboarder, started Sims Snowboards, one of the early pioneers of the sport. And he definitely zeroed in on Craig and said, he's something special. They said he's got the best style today. Out of, at that point, the contest, there was like 30 people, granted. <laughs> so, but of those 30, Craig stood out and he pointed them out and picked him out and invited him to come to another contest. And that was only an ultimate, not only achievement, but just compliment for him. I think that the way... Jeff Fulton, who was another local rider there, the way he explained it was the coolest guy in board sports, Tom Sims, invites you to the next contest. And what he's basically saying is you rip and I want to have a second look at you because he had the coolest team. Yeah, I think it came down to style for Craig. And like you said, you know, he didn't win right away. And I really want to hammer home that whole cerebral part of it, because I think you really do that in the book as well, is that he was constantly thinking ahead of everybody else. When everybody is starting to focus on one event, he switches over to a different event where everybody's like, dude, no one cares about that one. And it was almost like either he knew which way the wind was going to blow or he made it go that way. He always seemed to be a step ahead, right? Yeah, he, he really did. I mean, what's cool about Craig, what he, the insights that he had is he remembered what it was like to be a kid snowboarding down the mountain for fun. And first he thought, I'm going to get good at this and I'm going to race and I'm going to, you know, ride the moguls and I'm going to do the half pipe because that's how I'm going to get someone to pay for me to do this. But what do I really want to do? I want to go free ride. Everybody after the contest, everyone wanted to get done with the contest so they could go free ride. And as he was training and building his way up to get the overall world champion title, he got good at everything. But in the back of his mind, he did things like he would notice that there were a lot more photographers around the half pipe. The airs and the tricks were what everybody was really interested in. So he started to realize, hey, that's where the money is. That's where people are going to be interested. And so he started realizing, hey, I got to get really good at freestyle. So he got his world titles in racing. And then he said, I'm going to focus only on freestyle. And then sure enough, he got the first freestyle title for Burton Snowboards, who also, um, you know, sponsored him, became his main sponsor. There there was a whole legal battle over Craig between the two biggest brands um, and they went to court and it was a giant fiasco. And that's some of the cool, I don't know, I guess the, um, the drama in the sport that a lot of people don't realize early on, the two biggest brands in the sport identified Craig Kelly as the guy to promote. And Craig left one of them and went to another. And the other one was like, wait a minute, your contract is still with me. It started a massive legal battle. And Craig's dad at one point said, you know, a lot of people said it was going to take the Olympics for the sport to grow up. And he would say, you know, it only took one big legal battle because then when that happened, that showed it was for real. And I thought that was kind of a, a interesting way to say it. When he realized that all the cameras were at the half pipe, he started realizing, hey, this is what I want to focus on. And then after a while, he realized, hey, I really miss riding powder. And he, and he would always look back at what is motivating me and what was the original motivator for me. It was fun. 
and it was fresh powder. And he thought, you know what? That's what I want to do. I don't care if I'm going to get a world title. I want to go and ride powder. He did this to the chagrin of his sponsor, you know, like, what? You're going to stop competing? Wait a minute. Titles matter. And he's like, well, you watch what happens. The next year, they supported that decision. Burton did. And he got more coverage than any other rider that following season. And he didn't enter a single contest because he would evolved and he would evolve by following his heart. And I think that was something that a lot of the riders really appreciated in Craig. He was kind of that guy who would make his own path and do what he wanted. Some people love to race and they're going to focus on that and they do it. He liked to race, but he liked the titles. And then after a while, the stress of the titles and everything started taking away from the fun. And he realized, I got to find what brought me here in the first place. And that was the backcountry. And that was powder. And that was free riding. And now, to be clear, like free riding is just basically no rules, no nothing. You just get yourself on a mountain and you go, right? Yeah, free riding is riding the whole mountain. Whatever you encounter on the mountain, it could be, you know, from the summit, the open bowls, the glades, the wind sculpted waves down into the trees. Then there's the moguls that happen after the snow gets tracked out, the airs, the quarter pipes, the natural hips, anything, whatever you encounter. And ultimately with the skateboarding mentality, that became man-made items as well, like the picnic benches and rails and the whole park um, mentality, you know, came into being and they, what they called jibbing and jibbing was really the riding anything that was not snow. And that could be rails, uh, you know, people brought the first car and parked it on the slope and they would you know just like skateboarders would ollie over them so free riding is a whole mountain i mean listen this book has an avalanche in it and this actual part that we're talking about here might have given me more anxiety because he was at the top of his game he was getting paid right he had personal stuff going on that he wanted to make sure he's taking care of his family he's getting paid like this is like jordan in the middle of it saying i'm gonna go play street ball And you're like, but you're at the top of your game. You're getting paid. Like, this is where the attention is. And he just says, I'm going to go do my thing that I'm going to make happy. And then I'm still going to figure out a way to make money off of it, but only as long as I'm happy. I mean, it's an absolutely insane thing that worked out for him. But again, he just seemed to know which way that wind was blowing. He did. And it it really came down to, I think, his ability to step back and really look at any given situation and find his own pathway through it. What I find interesting too, and this is throughout the book and it it comes up more later, he's also able to do this because he is so well liked, right? That he can make these decisions and even with the court case and everything, it's almost kind of like, hey, people are doing what they're going to do, but it's not necessarily Craig's fault. Even when he is, you know, the king of the mountain, he seems to be that type of guy that's If you're next to him on the lift, he's going to talk to you and you have questions. He's going to sit there and answer them for you and things like that. He just seemed to kind of be that type of person that's perfect to build a sport around, right? Yeah. You know, what you just described is an ambassador. He was the first ambassador of the sport. By example, he could recruit skiers. A skier would watch him snowboard and say, hey, maybe I will try that. Versus some other kid that's just hacking his way down the mountain and falling on, you know, all the way down the mountain. You look at Craig and say, wow, that's nice. And then you could ask Craig, a newspaper man or a, a, a reporter, whoever would talk to him. And he could talk it up in a way that was just eloquent and understandable for a skier. You know, some of the guys were like, F skiers, throwing the bird. And he, someone would ask him that question, you know, and he would say, well, I actually was, you know, tried skiing. And for me, and he'd, he'd slow down. And he'd have those long pauses and he'd be thoughtful. And then he would turn around and say, but for me, it felt a little disjointed. But snowboarding felt like an extension of my body when I turned. I didn't even have to think about it. But on skis, it was very robotic to me. He would talk like that. And why wouldn't you want to try snowboarding after you heard that? The reason why Warren Miller, who, you know, the some would say is, you know, the king of ski movies, then Greg Stump, all these guys would hone in on Craig and they wanted him in their movies. And it wasn't only because he was the prime athlete. It was because he was um, somebody they'd want to work with. He would wake up in the morning. He would get there on time and uh, you know, he would have fun. He would be very, as one of his buddies said at his memorial service, you know, during all these times of Craig being very professional, I was um, always intrigued by the fact that there were times 
when we were very unprofessional. And that's what, that was the ability to kind of, you know, hang with the bros, but he could also get in front of a camera and eloquently explain why you should snowboard instead of ski in a way that never turned anybody off. And I love that word ambassador because it adds that extra component of he's not just a snowboarder who's like, I'm following my bliss, I'll figure out the money later. He took it all in. Snowboarding, check the box of the competition. Free riding, check the box on that. Making money, making it a thing, right, with his own personality. But even then, he's looking to that next phase of his life, which I found this absolutely fascinating. So he's done free riding. He decides, hey, I still kind of got to figure out what I'm doing next. What does that lead him do as, let's call it a career? What does that lead him to and the certifications that he's got to get? First of all, when he walked away from it all, if you look at today's money, he was making about a million dollars. You know, he made about a million dollars in a single year. And a big chunk of that, maybe, you know, a couple hundred thousand worth of that was from competitions. So he walked away from that without even looking back. He thought, okay, I don't need that. He was very smart with the money. When a lot of the guys were buying cars and partying, he was investing in real estate. When Craig walked away from it all, he wanted to remain stimulated. Because he is this cerebral guy and free riding was great, but he also wanted to, you know, understand the mountain. And it got to a point where he also wanted to share the mountain with other people. For a long time, he would admittedly said, I'm pretty selfish. Like powder day is no, there's no friends in powder or pizza. That includes family. I mean, he was very self-centered as far as getting his turns in and doing what he wanted to do, but he got to a point, And I think parenthood, he even admitted, did that to him. He realized, Hey, there's something really special about sharing the mountain. But if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it safely. And maybe I can make a career out of this. He wanted to open a lodge for people who would hike for their turns or earn their turns. And to do that, um, he had a path he had to take. And that would have been to become a mountain guide. Becoming a mountain guide for the ACMG, the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, is the equivalent of the special operations forces in the world's militaries. They're the top you know, 10% and they kick ass and they know what they're doing. But at the same time, they're taking people with them. Think of a Navy SEAL who is being trained to operate in a hostile environment, but then imagine them being responsible to drag two, three, four, five, eight people with them and bring them back alive. He's not getting shot at, but he is still dealing with the weather, avalanches, snow, route choices, cliffs. You know, there's a lot of, of dangers and uh, that is you know, what it means to be a mountain guide. And he jumped into it wholeheartedly. And he wanted to become the first snowboarder to achieve that goal. Well, I was about to say, even then, there was prejudice against him, right? Like, this is a guy who has done it all for snowboarding, but then he wants to become a mountain guide. And oops, one of the problems is we only have this for skiers. Yeah. And you're a snowboarder, and, well, you're still going to have to ski. And he has to basically figure out how to ski at the last second, right? Because it's it's not the same thing, right? For somebody who hasn't done both, mm -hmm. you can't just jump on a snowboard and the next day like, oh, I know how to ride snow, so now I'm a skier the next day. It, it's two different things, right? Yeah, not in that kind of environment. I mean, maybe on a groomed, you know, blue run or green run at a, at a resort, you could kind of make your way down the mountain. But in the wild snow of the backcountry with, you know, um, unpredictable terrain, no, you could not do that. First of all, one thing that was uh, going on at this point, there was some new technology in snowboards and the split board is, you know, you can do an entire episode on the split board alone, but it's basically a snowboard that is cut down the center vertically. So you have two different skis and it kind of allows you to stay on top of the snow, kind of like snowshoes and walk up the mountain with climbing skins, kind of in their Norwegian fashion back in the Nordic fashion of they used to use uh, animal skins on the bottoms of their skis so you can slide forward, but not backwards. And that was what Craig was using. And once that technology was available, they thought, hey, we can do what the skiers are doing to become mountain guides. But the again, what you said, the, um, the mountain guides who had been lifelong skiers, some of it's a European mentality, the old school, whatever you want to call it. But they looked at Craig, they're all, you can't do what we do on that. And um, he said, you know, I've heard this all before. I remember, you know, when I was turned away from ski resorts because you can't make it down our mountain. Well, he'd proven him wrong once and he was going to do it again. He was committed to not only do this for himself, but also for the sport. He could have taken the time to learn to ski. And then what you can do is once you have the certification, you can put it with the skis away and use whatever you want. 
whatever's in your toolbox for any given situation. But he thought that that would be a you know a disservice on the sport of snowboarding and other snowboarders. He wanted to open up the door to mountain guiding to all snowboarders. And, you know, over time it ultimately happened, but he was the first one that knocked down the doors because he um, passed all the prerequisites and just started shipping away at the, pre- at the requisites and passing the courses. And, you know, we know what happened, but, but it's, um, it's tragic that he wasn't the first, but he definitely opened the door. Now it's very clear. You did a lot of avalanche research for the book and you make it really succinct, which I really appreciate. Too much science makes my head hurt. I got to go lie down for a little bit. <laughs> but I mean, listen, you're a boarder. Did you learn too much about avalanches? Because I have to feel like if you get deep into this stuff, does it make you, you know, look at a mountain differently? Or do you almost feel a little bit better having more information about it? I'll tell you what, for me, taking my level one Canadian Avalanche Association course, for me, I took away some really important things. And one of the big ones is is route finding. Like, where do you want to be on a mountain? And it really quickly teaches you avoid the terrain traps where the snow is going to pile up at the bottom of a run if it slides or certain, you know, convex slope has less support. Where do you want to be on the mountain? You can cut down, I think, on 50% of your risk just by knowing where to be. And then you get into the snow itself. And there's, you know, the fact that different storms create different layers and whether or not those layers bond together. There's all these things that you learn and um, you can get really sciencey in that aspect of it. And then you have the decisions of, you know, how do you go between you and me, three or four buddies sitting there saying, where are we going to go and what are we going to do today? That's the human factor. And, you know, a lot of people will say, if you haven't made up your mind on what you want to do or what you don't want to do before you even set foot on the mountain, you're already risking way too much. You got to make that decision beforehand, like um, what you're willing to do. And it's the angle of the slope. There's so many aspects to it that I don't want to go into short term. But, you know, your listeners, I would say anybody that's interested in going into the backcountry, take an avalanche course and you will, at the end of the day, I don't think you'll look at the mountain with more fear. I think you'll look at the mountain with more respect. And then you're able to make more informed decisions. And you're never going to be able to get rid of all the risk and take it away. That's, that's, that's part of being there. I mean, there's even risk in bounds. You, you know, look what just happened at the Palisades in Tahoe recently, a couple of weeks back. In bounds, someone was killed. We're in a controlled area that was opened up by the ski patrol. There's always some risk. All the training I ever had in Avalanche never made me more fearful of the mountains. It only just made me more respectful. And if anything, it made me realize, hey, I can have just as much fun, maybe doing something a little mellower. And certainly this book has taught me that, you know, doing the research for this book. You can have a great adventure that you don't have to die for. It's very interesting how the book, right, it's it's this, all of it's really a celebration of Craig, but... It's almost like the first two thirds of the celebration of him of snowboarding. And then you have this last section that's tension. Did it feel differently writing those sections where you're like, I'm getting to the point where something terrible is going to happen. And um, I mean, sometimes it almost feels like a Stephen King book because you know it's coming and you're just waiting for that point. Do you feel that as a writer when you're doing that, where where you're going from something where you get to just celebrate this guy and then you're about to hit a tragedy where multiple people are going to die? God, that's a great question. I know it's coming. My job as a writer is to do exactly what you're saying. Make it that Stephen King movie. I want to, I want to build it up. I want to show, you know, in retrospect, you have a lot of leeway. You have a lot of ammunition to make, build that drama with. And so I was really all about just planting the seeds of all the little things that build up. And in doing so, people who know avalanche science, they're going to get something out of that. But so do the people who don't know anything. And I really just started it with the first storm that season. You know, I said, you know, it's a sleeping dragon under the snow. And I basically introduced that dragon early on. And then by anecdotes, I just, you know, built it up where the dragon stirred and then the dragon woke up and you see this happening and it's kind of like in a horror movie, you know how you, you'll sometimes, or a thrasher, an old, an old thrasher movie where they will have somebody walking down the hallway and it's dark and there's a closet and you're like, don't open the closet. That's kind of what I wanted to do with the book. So you can build that tension. And at the same time, you're learning something, especially if you know what's going on. You say these and you see where the wrong turns. And again, really easy to do in retrospect, but on the spot, you watch it. And you hear it and you feel it and you smell it and you taste it. And the reader's going, don't go there. 
I've let a few people read it who are big names in the sport. Jeremy Jones is, is one of the you know big mountain rider. He was one of the you know mountain athletes of the year by National Geographic at one point. And he's reading it and he knows all about avalanches. And he said just the other day, he wrote me, he said, I'm getting to the point of the avalanche and I am, I know what's going to happen yet. I'm praying for a different outcome. And he just said, good job, man. Um, Cause that's really what it is. I think that you see it coming, you realize it's coming and you want it to be different. And because of that, I think people will learn from the book because if you're able to die, you know, get the essence of what's going wrong while you're reading along, I think you're going to be able to do that when you're in the mountains yourself. You also, and we talked before we hit record, you had talked about all of these people you got to interview. And I always like to hear from the author, you're talking to people who, for many of them, this was the worst day of their lives. It, it was a, a literal horror show for them. When this happened and you got to talk to these people, how do you even approach that conversation, right? Because you want to get to the book. You want to give all these points of view, like what you're just talking about. But at the same time, you know you're opening up a pretty dark day for them to kind of relive. How do you even have those conversations or do you just do you just let them go? Because, I mean, for some people, I'm sure it's a release to finally kind of talk about it. Yeah. For one thing, I, I really approach it kind of like I just answered that last question where, you know, we want to find out what happened. And there were so many questions remaining, even for the survivors of what went wrong, that it was, there was this natural curiosity by a lot of people. A lot of people would say, I'll share what I, what I did, hoping that other people will share as well. And we'll finally get to the bottom of what happened. And so there was that innate curiosity, but there was also that ripping off the bandaid or, you know, reopening that scar and pouring salt on the wound of a, of a horrible day. I always am just very honest in it. I say, hey, listen, I want to hear every aspect of anything that you remember. And I didn't know it, but then some people, one guy said, oh, I that whole night after it happened, I sat there and made notes. I'll share my, my journal with you. Another person was interviewed by somebody and that person told me about this person and gave me the raw interview tape. So there were things that I got that were done, you know, moments, if not hours or days, and in some cases, maybe a year after the event, which really helped me piecing it together to kind of to fact check the validity of what these people were remembering and reporting to me. When you're trying to uh, make sense of chaos and report chaos, which is really what was going on after this avalanche occurred, there's always going to be fog, but you can piece together different people's points of view. And those can be the reference points in putting a story together in what I believe is the most accurate fashion you can when you're looking back at something. When the avalanche happens and everything you kind of go with from there, we won't go too deep into it, you just kind of feel the chaos. You feel the tension. You never want to give the whole book away. And I mean, we there's still so much more for people to read in this book. But it, it, the avalanche is almost kind of secondary to the decision making all around it that you're talking about, that there are people and Craig was not – a guy making the decisions there, he was there to learn stuff. And there was all of these things that outside of his control that ended this amazing life. And it's a hard read from that perspective to you fall in love with this guy. You know, he's a good guy. One of the things you point out is that right before this happened, he was helping people with their boards, with their skis and everything. Like he just showed up. He's like, some people recognize and some people didn't because he was just that kind of guy. He wasn't going to run around saying, I'm Craig Kelly. He's like, hey, I'm here to help out this week. Yeah, a lot of humility. A lot of people just thought of him as Craig. He was a guy that was shoveling the snow at the lodge and helped them with their luggage. So everybody understand, I mean, Craig was on what was called a practicum in Canada or an apprenticeship where between his horses to become a mountain guide, they were encouraged to go out and learn, get on the job training, so to speak, and to work in mountain areas and with other guides that um, you aren't accustomed to working with. So you learn new things. And he endeavored to learn as much as he could from the a renowned backcountry skiing mountain guide in Canada named Rudy Begliner and went up to Selkirk Mountain Experience because he had been told that this is the best place you can have an apprenticeship. And so he did his research. He knew this was a great place to learn and a great man to learn from, but he also learned it was going to be hard. And he heard this guy isn't the easiest guy to, he's not going to feather your ego. I think one of the people said at the one point, he said, yeah, oh, you're going up to SME, eh? Uh, they say, you better eat your Wheaties, pull out your leather underwear. I mean, these were quotes that I got directly from people 
who said that to Craig. So he knew he was going to learn with this guy who um, another person said, you know, yeah, the clients go to SME for the powder, but the people that go to work under him, the assistant guides and the apprentices, they're there for the storm. And that really is a great analogy for Rudy Beglinger. He basically would teach people, hey, I'm going to take you out in the worst weather. And he would basically train them to work with the mountains because the mountains are unpredictable. You know, some people thought that he pushed it too far. And um, some people said, hey, he gave the customers what they paid for. And the people who are going to this place to work go there want the steeper runs and they want to be pushed physically. Rudy always would say in his in his own um, interviews, in his own brochures, he would say, hey, the best runs that we're going to be on are, are 30 degrees and more. And the place where avalanches are most likely to occur are slopes that are 30 to, you know, 38 degrees. Um, so that's the area that's also the best ski run. And he would say anybody can kid themselves, but that's where avalanches occur. Every run is a potential avalanche run. That's when it was really interesting for me to dig into the science of it and understand what made him feel confident to go to the run and the area of the mountain, the avalanche that day. I wanted to decipher that and reverse engineer it to understand why they went there that day. So, Eric, normally what I finish up with for all the podcasts is, you know, that some people don't think nonfiction is interesting to read. I want to change it up a little bit for this one. What do you want people to know about Craig Kelly? What do you want them to take away from this book that they can walk away with? Craig didn't have an easy childhood, first of all. He overcame a lot in life. He was the type of guy who could be very serious and set a goal and achieve it and find success in it. But at the same time, he knew when to walk away from that and he could follow his bliss. And he wanted to follow his bliss in a way that still made a living. He really engineered his own life and career. You know, not too many of us can do that, but he set himself up for success by following his bliss, but working hard. He never thought that he knew too much. I think that Craig Kelly is a guy who had enough humility to understand there are always other people who know more than you. And he was a lifelong learner. And honestly, maybe that's it. Maybe that's what I love about Craig Kelly the most. He was a lifelong learner. Well, Eric, the book is amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this episode. Eric, thank you so much for coming on The Darkest White. Trust me, people, even if you're not into snowboarding, you're going to be into this book. It is that good. Hit us up Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Don't forget, YouTube channel. We got that. Hana, like, subscribe, all that stuff. But let's go ahead and do it. Till next time, nerds, stay cool. History Nerds United.